Women in the Bible aren't always shy or quiet. When we pay attention to their stories, we can see not only their particular fearsome lives, but also our own. They are foremothers of the faith. They're funny, demanding, and fierce. So as I mentioned a moment ago, I'm starting a new series today that I've been working on and looking forward to for quite a while now. I'm calling it Fierce. And as I said, we're going to be looking over the next several weeks at some of the stories of women in the Bible paying attention to their stories, to their struggle. You see, too often women in Scripture get overlooked. Sometimes they even go unnamed. Either that or they are simply players in a man's story, or maybe they're just morality tales about how to be better wives or mothers. But I would argue that in times like these, we need better feminine role models than that. That we need to see women who are strong and authentic, who aren't always shy or quiet. As the father of three girls, I want them to be able to look at Scripture and to know that they are powerful that they have a voice, that they are not subservient, that they are not second class. So over the next few weeks, we'll be looking at some of the stories in the Bible of some fierce women. And what we will discover is that their stories are oftentimes messy and challenging. They are beautiful, and they are always relevant to 21st century people. Now, let me just point out that the fact that we are kicking this series off On Mother's Day, that's no coincidence. That was planned. However, the fact that I am launching it at the end of the week when the news cycle has been filled with a story of women's rights possibly being limited by the Supreme Court, that is very coincidental. As I suspect, over the next several weeks, we will find this series to be somewhat timely. As I said to someone recently, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. So I believe the best place is always to start at the beginning. And so today we're going to look at the story of Eve. Now, as you may know, there are essentially two creation stories in Genesis, and we will be looking today at the second. In some ways, the stories are different. This one, as you will hear, is limited to the Garden of Eden. There's no mention at all of time. We don't know how long this process took. The order is different. The first human is made before anything else. God is more personal and immediate, planting and shaping the scene as opposed to sort of commanding or creating from a distance. And instead of the more formal, repetitive, poetic style of the first This one is a story with characters that interact with one another. And as we will hear, one of those characters is a woman by the name of Eve. She is a fierce woman of the Bible. And according to Genesis chapter 3, she is the mother of all living. I invite you to listen now to part of her story. Today's scripture comes from the book of Genesis, the second chapter, verses 4 through 7 and 15 through 22, and the third chapter, verses 1 through 13. Here begins the reading. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God had made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, And no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And there was no one to till the ground. But a stream would rise from the earth and water from the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man, formed man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. 
the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see that he could call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then the rib that Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open." And you will be like the tree, be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delightful to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some of her to her husband, who was with her and who ate it. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they made loin cloths for themselves, for they were realized they were naked. Then they heard sound of the breeze, and the man and his wife had themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself, he said. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Here ends the reading. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So at first, there was nothing. Or rather, there was something, but it was chaos. There was just this mess of light and dark, of dry and wet, of living and non-living, so it might as well have been nothing. But before there was nothing, there was God. And God was moving over the deep, this mess of chaos, breathing it in and bringing it out, wanting something instead of nothing, and so God made the world. God pulled apart the strands of the chaos and made mountains and rain and otters and cacti and swordfish, and nebulae, people. The first story of creation in Genesis 1, we see that God made men and women at the same time. And that God looked at them and all that something, all that everything that God has made and God pronounced that it was good, very good. And then God called it a day. But in the second story of creation, which we just heard, God goes about things in a different way, in a different order. It says that God took that new dry land and made a person out of it and called it Adama in human, in Hebrew, excuse me, which means dirt, it means soil, it means earth. God's person was genderless, it was a, a person made of mud, and so maybe you could call it an earth creature, an earthling. 
And when God saw that Adamah was lonely, God made the animals as companions. And Adamah liked the animals, thought the puppies were cute and the crocodiles were a little bit terrifying. The platypuses, well, they were just weird. But Adamah was still lonely. And so God put Adamah asleep and performed a bit of surgery separating it into two different people, called one Ish and the other one Isha. In Hebrew, woman and man. They were helpers to each other. They lived in the Garden of Eden. They cared for the garden and they cared for each other. But then God said, as God often does in origin stories of all over the world, you may eat of anything in this garden that I've made except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because if you eat that, you will die. So just don't, God says. And Ish and Isha said happily, sure thing, God, no problem, and they went about their day. And everything in the garden was good. Everyone got along. There was plenty to eat. The afternoons were lazy. Everything was fine, at least for a time anyway. Conflict always comes in stories like this. It's sort of a rule of writing a good story. Conflict came in the story of this story in the form of a snake, a sneaky serpent who sneaked sneakily. That's from the gospel according to Russ. I don't know if that's actually what it says, but that's how I picture it. Now, part of that is because in my house, we don't like snakes at all. Big ones, little ones, it doesn't matter. We do not like snakes. And my disdain for snakes, which I will admit fully is wrapped in fear, as we just learned today, is biblically justified. We shall not like snakes. It's a rule. It's a commandment. I don't know what you call it, but it's not a good thing. Now, I will also say that in my family, in my family, some of that fear, that disdain is also wrapped up in somewhat of intrigue. And so we have a family, as a family, we have a habit of sending each other videos of snakes. (laughs) People finding snakes in their couch. People finding snakes in their bathroom. Recently, one of my children sent me a a video of a snake eating a small deer in one giant gulp. Now, I have no idea why this child did this, but they have now been cut out of my will completely. (laughs) But I digress. So this woman is walking through the garden one day carrying a basket full of fruits and vegetables that she had just picked, that she had just harvested. And she passed under the shade of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when the sneaky serpent called to her and said, woman, woman, wouldn't you like to harvest from this tree too, the snake says. And the woman said, of course not. Of course not, you silly serpent, because God told us that we can eat anything except that tree, and that is a rule that I am not willing to break. Well, the serpent knew a challenge when he heard one and said, that is ridiculous. (laughs) You will not die. God only says this because this tree will open your eyes and you will be able to see everything just like God. Well, she looked at the fruit And it did look delicious and ripe and relatively harmless. And the truth is, she did want to see everything. Who doesn't want to see everything? There are even some that like to watch videos of snakes eating small deers. So she put down the basket. And as the hero often does in origin stories, she took one of the fruits and she ate it. And in that moment, her eyes were opened and she became conscious of herself. She became aware of just how beautiful everything around her was, how beautiful the garden was, how beautiful she was. 
She also became aware in that moment of how upset God would be when God found out about how much more there was to know in this world. Her eyes were open to the possibilities that curiosity can bring us. I guess you could say, in essence, she grew up. Next, she called the man. And when he showed up, she simply quietly handed him the fruit. And he looked at it, and he looked at her, and he looked back at the fruit, and he looked at her, and she just nodded. And he took a bite, and like her, he saw the world with new eyes. Maybe you could say it this way, that he too grew up. Though probably not quite as much, but that's another sermon for another time. And she called the man. The truth is, is that at some point, all of us grew up. All of us grew up. We see death and life and make the connection that other people are not us. That we are both separate but also dependent upon one another. That we are all a part of something bigger than ourselves. And I can only imagine that they just sort of stood there looking at each other and thought in that moment, we are going to get in so much trouble. And I'm sure they asked themselves if it was worth it. And at that point, they didn't know. But they just sort of disappeared into the bushes. And later, as God was walking in the garden, God called out to the man and the woman, and they answered nervously from behind the bush. And They didn't come out because they were naked. And God stopped and looked at them and and let out a sigh and just sort of said, you ate from the tree, didn't you? And then God made that face that parents make when they realize that their kids are growing up. You know that look, that face of joy and pride, but also some grief. And God asked what happened, and the man, of course, pointed at the woman and said, the woman, she gave it to me. And the woman, of course, pointed at the serpent and said, the serpent told me to eat it. Now, the part of this story that we didn't read was God's reaction, because God tells the snake in that moment that because of his sneakily sneaking that he would be cursed among all the other animals, upon your belly you shall go, the NRSV says. In other words, once again, my disdain for snakes is biblically justified. And to the man and to the woman, God says, essentially, this part of your story is now over. You've sought knowledge and received it, and know then that you can't stay in this protective garden any longer. Because knowing what you do, knowing that you can hurt one another, inevitably you will. You can no longer be children playing in the dirt. You will have pain in childbirth and you will have pain at work. Your children, your children will have pain as well. And you will not be able to prevent it. So go, my children, my beloved, go into the world and make your way. And what's interesting is it was only then in the story that they take names. It was at that point where man became Adam and woman became Eve, the mother of all living things. Now, years later, Eve did indeed experience pain in childbirth, in fact, twice. And her sons, Cain and Abel, they both grow up and they become farmers working the soil. But in a moment of jealousy and rage, there was this dispute that breaks out amongst them about which one offered the better offering. And in that moment, Cain kills Abel. And in so doing, broke his mother's heart. Now, I I always find it interesting that Genesis doesn't really talk about Eve's grief, but it is central to the story because Eve's grief is our grief. Because once we learn about death and and everything that we do from that moment forward is a response to knowing about that. We we live frenetically, hoping to to, to stay busy and productive, that if we do that, we'll be able to, to avoid death as long as possible. 
But like Abel, we will all die. And that breaks our hearts. You know, people often say that this story is about disobedience. And it is. God told Adam and Eve not to eat the fruit, and they did. It's about disobedience, not because because we needed to be punished, but because disobedience disobeying is what we do all too often. Now, what it is not about, what this story is not about, and I want to make sure that we are crystal clear about this, is this story is not about some legalistic give and take where God gives us this gift, and because we make poor choices that we have lost everything forever and always. Usually when Adam and Eve's story is told, it's, it's about how intimately, innately terrible and self-interested we all are. St. Augustine referred to this as original sin, and that name sort of stuck. Calvin, years later, would take it even further and refer to it as total depravity, that there is nothing good, that there is nothing even salvageable about us. But that's not what this story is about, is it? There was nothing about that in this story. Now, granted, around the time of Augustine, there was another gentleman by the name of Pelagius who read that same story and came out with something entirely different. He referred to it as original goodness, not original sin, but original goodness. And he said that there was nothing inherently evil in us, but that we have collectively gotten into very bad, self-interested habits. There's nothing inherently evil about us. We just oftentimes make really bad choices. Now, I don't know about you, but I like that theology, that understanding of what it means to be human in the fullest sense of the word. Now, granted, theologians and historians will tell you that Pelagius was condemned as a heretic, that his writings were burned, that he was exiled, Be that it is may, I still like his theology. And I suppose that from him we might also look at our own suffering and say that none of it's our fault. Reject any responsibility, but I don't think that's what the story's about either. Do you? You see, this story also isn't about marriage being one man and one woman either. I'm not saying that gender is not important. It's just that that's not the point of this story. It's certainly about marriage. It's about partnership. It's about caring for one another, about being one flesh, about being a companion in joy, a comfort in suffering. The other thing that this story is not about is about women being the beginning of evil about being tempters and deceivers, the source of man's sinful sexual desire. That's not what this story is about, and gentlemen, we need to know that that ultimately is on us. This, this kind of thinking is the voice of control and fear, and has been used for centuries to keep women in their place But that's not what the story says either, and we know it. You see, reinterpreting the story is not about finding an easy way out. The truth is, there isn't one. And Eve's story doesn't tell us what to do with the knowledge of the world's complexities, just that they exist. You see, the creation stories in Genesis are stories of origin or cause. The fancy word is etiology. They don't tell us how things ought to be. They just simply explain how things are. And in the language of one of my seminary professors, they are not prescriptive, but descriptive. Alice Connor, who's a theologian, an author, she said this about the stories, that these primordial stories, they cross cultures. They have rules that are supposed to be broken for them to be truthful. Breaking the rules is part of the story. Otherwise, otherwise there is no story. Otherwise, there is no resonance with our lives. 
You see, Eve is the seeker, the tester, the bringer of knowledge. She chooses to know and chooses to share what she knows. She doesn't give us a free pass out of our sin, but only shows us who we are and whose we are that we are hers, but also that we are God's. You see, Eve's story lives on beyond her curiosity, beyond her heartbreak. She teaches us that it's okay to want more, to to be more, to keep finding ways to to push the envelope, to, to seek, to test, to grow. She teaches us that fair Fierce women aren't always content with the way things have always been, but are constantly looking at ways to create, even if that means learning and living through heartache and pain. You see, church, Eve is more than just the beginning. She is the mother of all living things, She is the essence of what it means to be human in the fullest sense of the word. To push, to test, to question. May we, in the spirit of Eve, live lives filled with curiosity to challenge, to test, to push ourselves into being the very best that we can be. That is my prayer on this day and every day.
Today, we dedicate parents in the congregation to the nurture of young lives in the church. We celebrate the lives of John Walter Grady McClelland and Charlie Hayes Farrington McClelland, sons of Jennifer and Grady McClelland. Big brother and sister are Charlotte Ann and Andrew Bales. We celebrate the life of John Warren Rhodes, son of John and Catherine Rhodes. Big sisters are Sylvie and Vera. And we celebrate the life of Zia Maluz Gomez, daughter of Marcus and Erica Gomez. Her siblings are Alessandra and Isabella Trojel. Jesus said, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles themselves like this child, they are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, through his example, taught adults to love children, and the church must do the same. We will love these children through affirmation, kindness, warm words, accepting arms, example, and patience. <coughs> Parents are the key, and the rest of us are called to help them in giving to their children what they cannot. People of University Christian Church, do you promise to live so that these children know that they are loved by God and their church? And do you promise to welcome them with open arms and hearts into our community? If so, please say, with God's help, we will. With God's help, we will. And I suspect these families have brought extended family and friends. I would invite you to stand right where you are, please, the extended family and friends of these families. And I would ask now, will you give yourself to the nurture, to the growth, and to the love of these children? And will you support their parents as they strive to give their very best to their children? If so, please say, with the help of God, we will. Thank you. You may be seated. And to the parents, I would ask all of you on this day, will you give your very best to the lives of your children by loving and leading them to the love of Christ, first and foremost by example? And will you allow the community of faith to support you in prayer and in loving your child in ways beyond your reach? If so, please say, with the help of God, we will. And for the big brothers and sisters, I would ask now for your blessing. Do you promise to do your very best to love them always even when they steal your stuff? When they annoy you, when they wake you up in the middle of the night, do you promise to love them always and endlessly? If so, please say, we do. <laughs> We're going to live into that one a little bit. We're going to live into that one. So this is going to be fun. I've never carried four babies at the same time before. I can't wait to do this. All right, let's start down here. What are the names of these boys? This is John Walter Grady. John Walter, do you want to come with me, please? Okay. Come here, buddy. I think about, I like you. All right. Oh, <laughs> nope, nope. We're going to stand right there. What about you? See, this is Charlie Hayes. Hi, Charlie Hayes. Do you want to come with me? I want you to meet some people. Come with me. Come here. See all these people up here? Here, let me pick you up so you can see. Oh, what a big boy. <laughs> Are we crying or smiling? Oh, we're smiling. Do you see all those people back there? They're funny, aren't they? They're funny looking. I know. So it says in the book of Deuteronomy that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts and with all of our souls and with all of our mind, and we are to impress these covenants upon our children and our children's children. What do you think about that? <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? So we are reminding ourselves today what it means to be children of God. Look at those people up there. There's some more folks up there. Do you see them? Yeah, there's more up there too. And we are thankful for boys like this that remind us what it means to be a child of God. And who is this young man? John Warren Rhodes. Another John. Hey, buddy. Do you want to come with me? Look, we're just going to walk down here for a minute. You know, it says that it takes a village to raise a child. What do you think about all this, John? It takes a village to raise a child. And I believe that to be true. But I also know that it takes a church to teach children about Jesus. And their parents will do their very best 
to teach John and all of these others what it means to be a child of God, what it means to follow Jesus. But a lot of that responsibility also falls upon us. And so we take that vow and that oath and that commandment very seriously. Do you see them up there? What do you think about that? I like your bow tie, buddy. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There's Dad. Good. And who is this? What is your name, sweetheart? Zia. Zia. Do you want to come with me, sweetheart? Do you want? No. <laughs> I just had a flashback to high school when I reached out to a girl and she just <laughs> wanted nothing to do with me. Zia, I want you to know that you are a precious child of God and that you are loved as you are, not for what you do, but simply for who you are. And today we give you thanks and we give thanks to God for you. All right? Okay, good. Will you pray with me, please, church? And now, John Walter and Charlie and Warren and Zia, may God bless your mind that you might think while being a person of faith. May God bless your ears that you might hear the cry of the poor. May God bless your eyes that you might see the good in every person. May God bless your hands that you might embrace others in love as well as be embraced by others in love. And may God bless your feet that you might be quick to run to serve God in the common and in the everyday moments of life. Together, this is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.